All right, we're live. Hi, welcome to Sex Talk for Survivors. I am Jay and I have a wonderful moderator slash co-host slash answerer of really tough, complicated questions. This lovely person right here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Erin. And Erin and I are both from an organization called Strong in Nature. Uh, Strong in Nature is dedicated to helping survivors reclaim their pleasure. I usually phrase it differently, but really a lot of it is all about body reclamation and pleasure reclamation. And so we're thankful you're here tonight to work with us on that. So if you are a survivor of domestic violence or sexual trauma, and you're interested in sexual health topics, including our topic tonight, which is pleasure activism, then you are in the right place. Welcome. Uh, I hope it's a welcome back, but if it's a welcome for the first time, you are still very welcome. Before we dive in to this week's topic, just a reminder, this is an adult space, not because we don't cherish and value and honor our teen and youth survivors, um, simply because we have designed the uh, space around adults and we invite you to return when you are in that 18 and over age range. This is a safer space, a shame-free space, so let's keep our comments uh, in line with that whether they are made toward uh, Jay and Aaron, Aaron, so hard to get that right, or whether they are uh, with our other participants, please make sure that the comments um, take care of the emotional safety of those present. Also, while we're not completely confidential because we're a Facebook Live, um, I do want to just uh, call forward that I, even as I'm reading your comments, I probably won't say your name aloud. Um, that is because we do post pieces of these videos on other platforms and I don't have your consent to say your name aloud, but your comments are highly, highly, highly encouraged. What you have to say enriches this conversation. Aaron and I have a lot of experience and some expertise, but there's never been a sex talk that wasn't enriched by the comments that were added. Um, so please feel free to add your questions, your thoughts into our comments, uh, whether you're watching this live or whether you watch it on a replay or on a different platform like YouTube. We also, Erin, did you just drop that? Erin! <laughs> Erin just dropped our anonymous question form. Uh, if you have a comment or question that you want to share and you don't want your name attached, this is the link you should go to, and it is in our comments section. Um, these are also very helpful, and if you're thinking it, someone else probably is too, so please feel free to share those thoughts with us. Most importantly, take care of yourself. Uh, you are more important than anything we have to say tonight. And so if you need to step away, take a break, please do and rejoin us whenever you're ready. Your body will let you know when it's time for you to take a break. And we will always, always respect that. Now, hmm. uh, before I go much further, I do just want to uh, mention here tonight that we are pivoting some of our Strong in Nature programs. We do have an outdoor program coming up on July 9th. And so please stay tuned to our social media spaces for more information regarding that. I would love to see you on the trail. And we are continuing to do sex talk because we love it. And we love you being here with us. So when you join, say hi if you feel comfortable and let's get to it. Erin, have you heard of pleasure activism? I have not. I'm Ooh. very excited to learn more. <laughs> yes. Okay, so pleasure activism is the title of a book 
by Adrienne Marie Brown. Don't correct me on the way her middle name is pronounced. I watched a video today. It's pronounced Marie. Um, she pronounced it Marie, not like somebody else did. And I took that as the gospel. She pronounces it Marie. Um, so it's the title of her book. And it's also more of a concept that is uh, more widespread than a singular book. But tonight's uh, episode is going to be highly influenced by the words of Adrienne Marie Brown in Pleasure Activism. I am listening to it on audiobook um, currently, like I'm in the middle of it. And it's really calling to my mind uh, a book that was transformative in my own life, which was The Joy Diet. It's not, it's not food related. Uh, and this is by Martha Beck. And so I'm really pulling from each of these authors, uh, both who self-identify as women and I self-identify as a woman. So this is definitely going to be a perspective that is rooted in that identity. I recognize that the concept of gender is evolving. And at some point, this video may even be outdated. This is a concept that Adrienne Marie Brown shares in her book. The concept of uh, uh, gender binary is becoming more and more outdated and we're thinking of it as more of a spectrum. But as of the writing of The Joy Diet and as of the writing of uh, Pleasure Activism and as of me speaking tonight, the three of us all identify as women and that is um, central to our experience of seeking pleasure. So I do want to acknowledge that this is rooted in that identity even as those identities evolve and change over time. So, if you had to guess, Aaron, what would you say pleasure activism is, or what does it, like what associated phrases does it bring to mind? And if you're joining us tonight, please add into the comments, what phrases does the, the uh, term pleasure activism bring to your mind? I immediately thought of um, like radical uh, pleasure, if that makes sense. Like really like, um, I'm having a hard time thinking of words because I want to say something like dominating, but I don't think that that necessarily applies. I mean, it could, but like celebrating pleasure and like really like owning your pleasure and validating and normalizing it to the point where it's just like active, like, like activism, you know, like the same uh, a mindset of, of any type of like social justice activism or environmental activism, um, but applied to the body the, and maybe even uh, the female pleasure, because that's something that culturally kind of gets stigmatized and overlooked um, repeatedly because of our male centric um, patriarchal society. Well, Aaron said it all, so good night. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I think that you're like, that was so rich and it is so um, attuned to what I'm going to share tonight. And so I feel like just as you came in and said, no, I haven't really heard of pleasure activism, you still come in with such a knowledge of um of both of those words, pleasure and activism, and you have this great framework of how they may fit together. And I imagine those of you joining, tuning in from home may also. So why talk about pleasure activism with survivors of sexual trauma or domestic violence? Here is my perspective. This piece uh, is is very related to words in each book that I shared, but these are my own words. As a survivor, you have been deprived of your fair share of pleasure. Even if you as a part of your daily life now experience pleasure, uh, I am of the firm belief that there are systems in place to deprive you of your pleasure. 
There are systems that have told you um, you would not be treated fairly, you would not be believed, you would not be taken seriously um, if you advocated for yourself as a survivor. And I think that when there are so many systems in place, keeping you down, keeping you in your place, that you're experiencing chronic pleasure deprivation. In addition to the systems, your body has probably responded the way many survivors' bodies respond, with chronic pain, chronic fatigue, uh, eating disorder, um, autoimmune issues. These physical symptoms that survivors experience or um, physical conditions that become a chronic part of survivors' lives also suppress the pleasure that you were always meant to feel. You inherently deserve pleasure. Capitalism and culture have taught us that we must earn everything and that we somehow have to earn pleasure by um, dealing with all of the challenges of life that feel antithetical to pleasure. And yet I'm going to say that you deserved pleasure the moment you became yourself. And I think that when I say you, I mean we, I mean I, I think I have been, as a survivor, deprived of my pleasure, my fair share of it. I also want to acknowledge if you are Black, Indigenous, disabled, an immigrant, waiting on the right visa to be able to live your best life, uh, learning English and experiencing discrimination, if you are LGBTQ+, then your systems put in place depriving, of you, depriving you of your pleasure are more layered and more complex. Again, people who have not had their basic needs met of safety and security are easily controlled. And when we deprive people of the pleasure that they should have as an essential right, those people are more easily controlled and kept out of power. So pleasure activism for me means reclaiming our pleasure as a form of working toward justice. Acknowledging that there is so much in place that is trying to uh, prevent us from our come up, prevent us from being able to uh, access the spaces that folks would prefer we are out of. And yet, we can still access pleasure. And when we do, not only are we fortifying ourselves and making ourselves stronger to move through this world, but our pleasure is um, something that spreads in our communities. And when I say our communities, yes, of course, like our physical communities, but also my community is the community of survivors. That is one of my communities. Wherever you feel most at home, that's one of your communities. And if you can start reclaiming your pleasure, if you can start actively seeking it, then that will only positively impact the other people in your community. So that went on a bit longer than I expected, but Aaron, how does that sound 
in relation to what you shared about thoughts that come to your mind when you hear pleasure activism? It sounds right on. Um, you know, I, I had this memory while I was listening to you of being in one of my classes, I think, um, one of my graduate classes and talking about uh, pleasure as a biological need and how the response to it sometimes is is more like um, negative or stigmatized and it's not it's not treated like a basic need it's not mm -hmm. treated like a like everyone you know like we talk a lot about in our society there's a lot of talk about like free speech or um, you know these basic unalienable rights right um, but pleasure isn't one of them. But from a biological standpoint, it definitely should be like we need air and food and and shelter and pleasure. <laughs> um, and and that was so profound to me uh, that conversation as it was unfolding because the more I thought about it, the more sense it made, mm -hmm. and and how and the more like upset or sad that I felt that like in America, I know it's different in different countries. Um, and I'm not trying to give us a history lesson, but, you know, being founded or being um, the pure, the Puritan colonizers that came here that dominated, um, you know, really has created this, um, this impact, like you were saying that if we um, need other people or if we need uh, pleasure, that it's something you know, that we shouldn't need or that we need to not talk about or, uh, and it, I think that's really toxic and harmful. And, and especially in the, from the perspective, like you were saying, as a survivor, you know, being taught that um, you're not a priority and being denied pleasure, being um, marginalized in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's exactly what I imagined from those two words, um, and it really does a powerful, powerful thing, which is normalize pleasure as a need, as a basic human need, um, which I, I'm a big fan of. <laughs> Me too. I'm a big fan too. And I also want to um, just call forward that. When I say pleasure, I do indeed mean sexual pleasure, but I also, the more I explore the concept of pleasure, the more I don't know where that line has to be drawn. You know, when does a, a back massage, oh, this is strictly non-sexual and this is a sexual back massage. You know, if a back massage is happening, the, the line of what, isn't feeling sexual and what is feeling sexual, it's not always very clear and firm. And it's not always easy to tease apart those into two totally separate categories. So when I say pleasure, if your pleasure is found in eating a really warm bowl of oatmeal, I'm not going to say, Oh, that doesn't count. That's not sexual pleasure. So I'm going to keep the definition of pleasure really broad tonight. And I do want you to call to mind sexual pleasure as a piece of this, but that doesn't have to be your only thought. Um, I know we usually try to like niche down into really focusing around sexual health and sexual identity, sexual pleasure. But tonight, let pleasure be broad for you because that may lead you uh, through some of the exercises I'm gonna invite you in to do. So, we know that you have been denied your fair share of pleasure. We know that we have been denied our fair share of pleasure, but how then do we become pleasure activists? How do we fortify ourselves by reclaiming our pleasure if it's something that has not been a priority because we were taught it wasn't a priority. Like right now, if you're like, oh, I never pleasure myself, I never seek, don't shame yourself. We are not taught that our pleasure is a priority. And we're not taught that it's a basic need. 
Never, ever did I sit in any biology class or social studies class or psychology class where they said, you know, it's food, water, warmth, shelter, pleasure. <laughs> they didn't say that. So I just want you to really love on yourself through this whole process. But I have an initial question. It is inspired by the book Pleasure Activism. And I want to ask it of Aaron and of you who are tuning in. Um, please share in the comments, uh, even if you're watching this on the replay. And um, I think this is a really interesting question, which is what is your pleasure lineage? So call to your mind people, whether they be family, or influential adults who were in your life when you were young, or whether they be people that you've read their books or their poems. Who is in your pleasure lineage? Who taught you about what pleasure is? I think for me, I call to mind my Nana who we never had a conversation about sexual pleasure, but I feel like she demonstrated seeking pleasure in the way she prepared food from scratch and then enjoyed the food she prepared. She didn't just prepare it and then get to cleaning up or, you know, she sat down and she enjoyed the food that she prepared and the food that others prepared and brought to that same table. She also loved, loved, loved looking at home decor magazines. And then she would actually do things she found in those magazines in her own home. Uh, you know, of course, at her own like budget level and with her own style. But I, I feel like that's such a good and powerful example for someone who didn't see other folks really prioritizing making one's home like their, their safe space, their nest, to see her kind of pouring over whether you needed curtains or whether you just needed some nice wooden blinds or how could you create a space for yourself? And that's what she was truly doing. Like she wasn't creating her space for her spouse. She was creating that space for herself in a lot of ways. And I feel like she was a strong example of actively seeking pleasure. Erin, did anyone come to your mind? Um, it's so funny that you spoke about your Nana because I also immediately thought of my grandma and I feel like it was like funny, like, uh, you know, who thinks of their grandma <laughs> thinking about pleasure? Um, but I did. I also immediately thought of my grandma and um, uh, just her personality. She loved life and she loved celebrations, parties. We would watch um, Telemundo all day long together. And she would say, Aaron, did you see those shoes that girl had on? Did you see those shoes? Aaron, look at that dress. Like she just loved it and she lived for it. And um, she, I remember her home was really fine, you know, and it wasn't expensive, but it was like the things that she brought that were, you know, she liked the way they looked. They brought her pleasure and happiness and it was her space. And she had these perfume bottles that were shaped like flowers and these little figurines in a China cabinet that were just, um, like little farmers, I think. Um, but just the care that she put into placing these items in her home, I could tell that that was pleasure that really, you know, brought joy to her life. And so, um, and she liked earrings and, you know, showy stuff. She, she was really just a fun person. And um, yeah, I think that was probably the beginning of understanding, you know, joy in, in something, you know, and really and just something just for me, you know, because those things like I didn't care about those little farmer figurines. I mean, now I do. I wish I had them <laughs> because they were hers. But, um, you know, that's not what I would pick. But her her joy for it, you know, is what 
taught me like, oh, I can have that, but for like what I would pick. And um, yeah, that was so, I think that was really meaningful during my formative years. And she would make things too. She would make bird houses and back scratchers. And she made these flowers out of like soda can, you know, the cans used to come, you have to cut them because the turtles, <laughs> she would make flowers out of the rings, the plastic rings for the soda cans. And um, she taught me how to make all those things. And it was, it was just like this joy in these little things. That was, it was great. Yeah, it was great. And my cousin too, my cousin who we joke and call each other sister cousin. <laughs> she also really taught me about, you know, just pleasure and um, little things like watching movies or reading books or eating a chocolate bar. <laughs> um, yeah. And I cherish those memories. Thank you for sharing that. I hope that those of you who are watching will maybe drop some comments, share like who's in your pleasure lineage. And if you don't have a family member, um, I'll ask two things of you. If you don't have an ancestor, a family member, or someone who felt like family, my first question is, is there somebody in your past who people shamed for seeking pleasure and who maybe you thought poorly of them because of what people told you to think? Um, I know... I can remember times when I felt a sense of shame when I saw people seeking sexual pleasure. I thought, oh, that's wrong or naughty or um, it makes them like a, um, not as sophisticated of a person because I was taught that, you know, seeking sexual pleasure, having uh, more than one sexual partner, um, having children by multiple different men, that these were things that people shouldn't take pride in, shouldn't feel good about, that they were shameful. And I think one thing I'm really reconsidering is who did I look at as a young child and perhaps think they were making bad choices because of what I was told about their choices, but now upon second look with a pleasure lens, were they actually making choices that really honored their own pleasure? That's something to consider. Um, and also, if you're still having trouble calling people to mind, which honestly, I, I am. I don't have like a long pleasure lineage yet. Um, it's something that I'm still building. But I didn't, I'd ask you to think about authors who wrote words that just stayed in your mouth or just replayed in your mind that just resonated with you so deeply, were they pleasure seekers? Were they authors who were honoring their own pleasure in some way? It doesn't mean that they never sacrificed. It doesn't mean that they uh, never accepted deprivation of some sort, but were they also still actively pursuing their own pleasure? When I ask myself that question and I look at the authors on my shelf back there, I start to recognize, wow, I'm really inspired by people who honor their own pleasure. So the second question I have for you, this one also is still pretty inspired by Adrienne Marie Brown is what gives you an orgasmic yes? Aaron, when I say that phrase orgasmic yes, because as far as I've heard in the book, Adrian Marie Brown doesn't actually define orgasmic yes. So it's really left up to the reader's interpretation. What do you, what does it mean to you? Um, well, I immediately thought of eating cheese. That's so horrible. Um, <laughs> because, cheese, I mean, cheese is, there's places in your brain that light up the pleasure okay. centers when you eat cheese. And um, that, like, it's almost like the feeling of, like, relief and ecstasy at the same time. 
Mm. And that to me is an orgasmic yes. And it could be anything. Like it could be an actual physical orgasm or it could be finding out that I passed a test um, or it could be my period came, you know, <laughs> like it's relief and ecstasy at the same time. Um, and that to me is the orgasmic yes. And I also feel that with cheese. So. <laughs> when I'm really hungry. <laughs> And that's so good because what a good awareness you have of your own body's experience. And I want to invite our viewers, even if you have not yet or you're unsure if you have experienced orgasm, what do you imagine it to feel like? Because you have a sense of knowing about yourself and your own body. So even if that hasn't been a part of what you've experienced thus far, I think you still have some sense of what an orgasm would feel like. And so an orgasmic yes is going to be reflective of that. For me, when I hear orgasmic yes, I think of a whole body experience. I think of something that I just feel everywhere. And in thinking about when I have had those types of yeses outside of actual sexual orgasm, it's interesting to think like, well, what were the times when my entire body said yes to something? And have I always been able to feel an orgasmic yes? Or has it only been during the periods in my life when I feel especially connected to my own body? I think to kind of further expand on this, I'm actually going to see if I can find a page in this book that I think will be really helpful. Um, it's where Martha Beck is talking about desire. And she talks about kind of like following your heart's desire, which sounds cliche, but not the way she puts it together. And she draws a line between false desires and true desires. And it kind of mirrors in some, in some ways what Adrian Marie Brown says between um, excess pleasure and genuine authentic pleasure. Um, we all know that pleasure can be derived from sex, it can be derived from drugs, it can be derived from exercise, but there's also an excessive version of each of those. And because we've been so repressed, oftentimes when we think of pleasure, we our brains kind of go to the excessive, uh, an excessive form of drug use, an excessive uh, way of experiencing sex that might even kind of disconnect pleasure from sensation, uh, where things get, um, hmm, I don't, I, want, I don't want to say twisted because that sounds too judgmental, but maybe it's more of an idea of pleasure than an actual experience of pleasure. Um, and the same could be true for, for really any way we seek pleasure. There's an excessive version or a kind of a false version, and then a version for us that feels like, oh, that's enough. I feel satisfied by that. That was, that was what I really wanted or needed, like we said earlier. Okay, so I'm going to read to you a little bit about false desire versus true desires. So when you have a desire, one thing to check in is how does your body feel about that desire? I have a really good example. I have really wanted to buy a house by myself. And sometimes I've been chasing houses because the housing market is tough all over. But uh, I happen to live in an area where there's very, very few houses on the market. And sometimes I was chasing houses and I would check in with myself because I didn't even know how I felt about a house sometimes, honestly, because it was just, there's so few and my budget's tight and I'm trying to find the right house. And sometimes I would sit with a certain house in mind and think like, okay, well, how do I feel when I think about this house? So desiring a house and simultaneously feeling anxious or like I'm grasping 
those were not the houses for me. That was a false desire. That was a, a desire born out of fear. When I can think about a certain house and feel joyful, feel releasing, feel generous instead of withholding, when a home feels open to me and like, oh, I want to share this. I want to experience this home with the people I love. That, that's a different kind of desire. Um, a couple other ideas about false desire versus true desire. The basis of false desires can be things like another's failure. Have we ever desired something because it meant someone else failed? Um, False desires are also rooted in good things are scarce. I'm going to tell you right now. I have a big, hmm, try not to be too self-critical. I really have a lot of work to do around thinking that money is scarce. Um, I have a lot of stories uh, it, within myself um, about the scarcity of money. And sometimes my desire for more money or a new job is born out of that fear of scarcity, that lack of abundance. Do I take my next job because I'm scared that I don't have enough? Or do I take my next job because life is about cooperation and this job feels like a healthy form of cooperation where I support the organization and the organization supports me or the institution. These are some interesting things. Again, false desires might have to do with deception or secrecy, whereas true desires might be more rooted in honesty and openness. So I, I think all of this can almost be symbolized by if you have a, desi a desire and when you hold it, you feel like this, that may not be your true desire. If you have a desire and when you hold it, you feel like, oh, like open, deep breath, that may be a true desire. Erin, any thoughts around that? I know that you always surprise me with what you're learning uh, as you seek your degree in uh, becoming a licensed therapist. Any thoughts around what I'm saying? Does it resonate? Oh yeah, it totally resonates. I think, um, you know, a lot of humans and it's not their fault. Um, I know I'm definitely uh, someone who engaged in this behavior in the past and probably still does from time to time, um, you know, there's this scarcity mindset and it kind of creates this maladaptive coping mechanism of um, defensiveness. And I know that as I've grown as a person and learned more, um, I feel healthier and better when I'm not like hyper aware and defensive around you know, my desires or goals or, or dreams. And when I can have conversations with myself that are like, what this, what the next person achieves or accomplishes or does side by side to me in no way detracts from me because we're not the same person. Um, that's when I started having a more like awareness and healthy mindset around, um, I, I think, you know, true desires because it's easy. I think I know it's a, a lot of acculturation, you know, our manifest destiny, again, not a history lesson, but it's just so impactful on us as individuals, the way our culture kind of leads us to pursue our desires and in the comp competitiveness. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's a really powerful self-awareness to, to come to that realization of um, 
what's a true desire? Is it harmful? You know, and that's a conversation I have with myself. Like, what is the benefit of this? Is anyone being hurt? And if the answer is yes, then I'm like, then that's not something I'm going to do. Because yeah. it's not for me, you know, some, the way I want to interact in my community. Unless it's a boundary. Like if I'm setting a boundary, then I'm like, yes, I will. <laughs> I'm sorry that hurts you. This is my boundary. <laughs> so. Oh, Jamie, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. I do just want to applaud what you're saying, though, about like your pleasure, your following your desire, your success. It doesn't have to take away from others. In fact, it may be the example that others need, the normalization that others need in order to pursue their own desires, their own pleasure and their own success. And I know you keep saying it's not a history lesson, but just as we're acknowledging our pleasure lineage, I think it's important to acknowledge the history that has led us to this point of denying ourselves pleasure consistently, routinely, routinely saying, Ooh, I'd really like to rest and I haven't earned it. Or, oh man, you know what would feel so good is a massage. And maybe I can't afford one, but I could rub my own feet. But you know what? I need to do the dishes. I need to do this. I do think it's important to acknowledge the history. And I'm glad that you're bringing that into the conversation. Thank you. So we've talked about acknowledging our pleasure lineage, and I do think that that felt inspiring and moving to me, that when I seek my pleasure, I am fulfilling what my ancestors, what my people put into motion. I also love kind of following our orgasmic yes. Even chasing our orgasmic yes feels fun. Like not a bad kind of chase, not like a, uh, uh, I, can't, I can't ever get to it. But like it feels playful to think about, okay, well, how am I going? It's like a game of tag. How am I going to strategize to tag into my orgasmic yes more often? Um, and so now I want us to kind of talk about following a desire trail because often life is life and we may not be super in touch with our orgasmic yes we may not be super in touch with our pleasure and we may be have been socialized to be super dismissive of our desire so here comes the fun part. This is inspired by Martha Beck, but it's also kind of my own version for this specific sex talk and for us as survivors. Ask yourself what you really desire. And when you've answered that question, say, no, but what do you really desire? and follow the little flickers, the little, like, like a crumb trail. So maybe you think of something that seems totally silly and unrelated. Like one thing that just popped into my mind was like key lime pie from the Florida Keys. Now, right now I could be like, but Florida's legislation, I don't wanna support a state like that. You know what? Also, ugh, humidity and I don't have the money to go to Florida. Okay. Yeah. All right. Gotcha. But if you stay with the little flickers of desire, you are opening yourself up in new ways. If you're not constantly shutting down your ideas around what would be pleasurable to you, 
you're opening yourself up to pleasure. And don't be afraid of what you name. Even if it makes you a little uncomfortable, even if you're like, wow, that's a sexual kink that I don't know if I'm totally comfortable with that. I don't know if it calls to you even a little bit, just stay with it for a while. I'm not asking you to act on what immediately comes to mind, just as I'm not telling myself, okay, well, prove it, buy a plane ticket to the Florida Keys and get yourself that key lime pie tomorrow. I'm asking us in this community to stay with what comes to mind as we keep asking ourselves what we desire. Without judgment, without a lot of shaming, stay with it and continue to say, okay, but what do you really desire? Or okay, and what else do you really desire? And just let yourself go follow this desire trail. Now, if it cuts off, if you feel the sensation of, okay, this is dangerous, this isn't safe anymore, I'm not following, that is okay. It may come back up for you in a time where you do feel safer. Maybe some of your other basic needs are being met and it feels okay to access the space where you're engaging with ideas around your own desires, your own pleasure more. This is one of those things, ugh, it's like orgasms and learning algebra. The more you force it, the less you're gonna be able to do it. So you really just have to kind of breathe and flow into it. And if it starts to feel anxious and tight and that sensation, then let it go for a while until you can kind of just flow like goo into it, <laughs> kind of get oozy. That's like the, the mental picture I have right now. It's just like oozing into it. <laughs> and if that grosses you out, totally come up with your own butterflying into it or whatever feels gentle and unforced. Aaron, what do you think would be the benefit of thinking about our desires if they seem um, unattainable? I think goal setting <laughs> could be a benefit. Um, I like how you talked about the trail um, and following the desire trail. And that made me think of one thing that I do with my kids, especially, is um, I try to follow the needs. Like if the behavior, it might be undesirable or frustrating or, you know, I try to think let's what's underneath it and follow it kind of backwards. And I, I feel like this is like the opposite of that, where you're following it forwards. And I really love that like so much because I do that with myself all the time where I'm like, why am I upset? And then I try to like just go backwards and follow the needs to the root and then I tell myself, okay, well, that's what your problem is or that's what the issue is or that's what your need is. And then if I can meet it, you know, that helps me. And, and this is like the next step that is just so brilliant of like, not just meeting a need, but seeking um, a, a, a validation in a way of of the desire or the pleasure. And I love the term desire trail. It's just that and pleasure lineage tonight. I'm like, oh my gosh. Thank <laughs> you. I'm so excited that I was able to, um, what do they call it? Oh, like glean this from some of my resources. And, and what I'm presenting tonight is in no way uh, an encapsulated, abbreviated version of the full book, Pleasure Activism, not at all. Um, so I highly encourage you read the book, Pleasure Activism, and I highly enc encourage you to read The Joy Diet. Um, both, I think, have so much value 
and expanding upon what we're saying tonight. But yeah, I like um, what you're saying about how we, we can move backward and forward in whatever space we're in, whatever feeling we're having. And that's that feels freeing to me, suddenly to have this acknowledgement of, oh yeah, if I have a certain feeling, I can follow it forward or I can trace it back. And that's a that's a beautiful thing to not feel like only one is an option. Um, I'll give a, a like a fun example too of why not only will following your desire trail give you um, awareness, give you an ability to set goals, but it also might drum up some pleasure in your life. So I know that lots and lots of people, including myself, find Jason Momoa attractive. So let's say I sit with myself and I'm like, but what do I really desire? And I'm like, oh, Jason Momoa, okay. Now that seems uh, superficial in some ways because he's on magazine covers and things. But if that's what comes to your mind, stay with it. Because what you may find is there's something that Jason Momoa means to you. He holds some meaning. Like, yes, oh my gosh, he's got all those muscles and all the that hair. But you might be like, you know what? I just, I'm so captivated by like his eyebrows. And then you may see similar eyebrows on another person. And that person may not really look like Jason Momoa. That person may not share a lot of identities with Jason Momoa, but you may see those eyebrows and it may give you some rush of pleasure to see those eyebrows somewhere in your real life. And to realize, oh wait, there are people walking in my community around me who have something that he has. So what I find pleasure in about him, I may find pleasure in people in my community. Maybe that's a pleasure I hold on to and keep to myself and just savor and enjoy. Or maybe that's a pleasure I pursue in actually knowing those people with those eyebrows or seeking out other people on a dating app who have those eyebrows. So these pleasure trails may seem like nonsensical when that little first nugget of desire happens, but you may find that the more you stay with it, the more is revealed to you about your own pleasure and about how it's actually already in your life, just waiting for you to savor it, just waiting for you to embrace it and say, yes, I'm ready for pleasure. Come to me. Do you think that's possible, Erin? Do you think it's possible that our desires that don't make sense could somehow show up in our lives? Oh yeah, heck yeah. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's possible. Yeah. I mean, like I'm like a person who believes in manifestation. <laughs> that sounds a little out there. But um, you know, the what you're enabling is the ability to open your mind and it could be that you know there's a quality that you're not realizing is what you desire because it's, it's the simple reaction is ooh sexy you know attraction and the deeper reaction is there's a quality there's something that i'm attracted to that's not just you know this initial kind of uh biological desire so and i think that it's super normal um and human to have those feelings and being able to open your mind will will i think i believe will enable people to to find what they desire i feel like uh was that book the secret <laughs> i feel like i just gave it away no i don't i know i didn't read that book 
<laughs> that's what I feel. I feel like it could be about her or something. I um yeah, I love that you called forward like uh, manif manifestation because there's that's kind of like I think I use this word too much, but that is like a spectrum too, right? From whether whether you're like what you believe you will create, you will manifest, but also like, have you ever bought a car and then once you buy that car, you see it everywhere? Because suddenly you have this new awareness of its existence and you're like, oh, okay. So now I drive a Subaru Outback and so does everyone else. <laughs> And they're also all the same color. And I do think that no matter where you are, whether you're just like, oh, okay, well, it's like confirmation bias. Like once you think something, then you see things that confirm what you already believe or whether you think you're actually manifesting something into existence. I think no matter where you kind of fall in that range, yes. Like once you're looking for something, you will see more of it. And so if you follow this desire trail and you're like, okay, so like, I really, really want to go to like uh, a big um, luau where there's like cultural dancing and there's fire and it feels like I'm in a tropical place. And this is like, it just feels like the ultimate pleasurable experience. I want to eat like uh, something juicy and it's running down my chin and that. I think that if you follow that, even if you're like, well, I can't buy a ticket to Hawaii, you're going to start to see elements of whatever that is and, and move toward them, I hope. I hope you move toward them. I hope you don't move away from them. And I do think, as we said earlier, you deserve that pleasure. You're, the world owes you that pleasure. So just like when someone owes you money, I hope you take it. Like take this pleasure. Take it. It's yours. It's owed to you. There have been so many systems in place. There have been so many uh, rules of socialization in place that have denied you your fair share. It's owed to you. So whether it's through chasing your orgasmic yes, or whether it's just following tiny little desire trail clues, whatever it is, when you do see something that's pleasurable and you have access to it and it does no harm, take it. Because it's yours. It always was. Any final thoughts, Erin? Okay. Thank you for tuning in, as Erin put down below. And we'll see you next week. And thank you for your patience, as we have some weeks where we don't show up, but we hope that you enjoy what other resources we share. And as always, we adore you and this time. Bye.